Hi everyone, this is Zico Callahan with Raptor Chatter, and we're going to be going over what happened for January 2021 in paleontology. So the biggest paper last month was the paper on Spinosaurus, which was in fact so massive that I have an entire separate video for it because I don't want to take up 10 minutes explaining everything that went into it in this video. So you can go check out that video, but as a quick summary, Spinosaurus probably lived a lot more like a stork than as a pursuit predator, which was suggested in the 2020 paper on Spinosaurus by Ibrahim et al. A lot of other researchers do like this kind of approach where it was more stork-like, and there's supposed to be more papers on Spinosaurus coming out this year. So there will be more to look forward to if you're interested in that animal. And other theropod dinosaurs that could have also gotten very large, there was some work done on tyrannosaurs. However, these were very small tyrannosaurs because this is some of the only juvenile and actually kind of newborn or newly hatched tyrannosaur material that we know of. The teeth were found to still have serrations, much like the adults did. However, they were also much thinner in general, with one exception, and that's the teeth at the very front of the upper jaw. And that's because these teeth had a very D-shaped kind of cross section, and this is something we find in a lot of the tyrannosaurs. And it was likely a feeding mechanism that they would use to help essentially scrape meat off of bones. However, since the young's teeth were so narrow compared to an adult tyrannosaurus tooth, which had a much rounder tooth cross section, it suggests that they were going after very distinctive and different prey types, rather than all competing for the same thing. Although, again, the feeding mechanism was largely the same. As for animals that would have interacted with some of these tyrannosaurs, we have animals like Parasaurolophus, which has been found to have at least three different species in the genus. However, some of their relations weren't exactly known, and a new paper and a new find helps to suggest that what we thought we knew about them isn't exactly correct. Parasaurolophus cerdocristatus had a much more curved crest than the other Parasaurolophuses, and so it was thought that it was a distinct group from the other two, at least relative to one another, although also closely related in that genus Parasaurolophus. A new fossil coming from the same formation as the first specimen of Parasaurolophus cerdocristatus has been shown to be actually a lot more closely related to one of these two other known species. Specifically, it suggests that Parasaurolophus turbicen is much closer related to cerdocristatus rather than being closer related to walkeri, Parasaurolophus walkeri, as had been suggested in the past. This study also sets up a Parasaurolophus specimen that comes from the Kaprowitz Formation of Utah, and it hasn't been formally described, but doesn't fit in very nicely with any of these other known species, so it's probably its own new species, at least based on what we know right now. Hopefully that fossil will be described in the near future, so we can try and understand just how diverse the Parasaurolophines actually were. As for some of the things that Parasaurolophus was probably eating, we have the flowering plants, or angiosperms, which really got a very good start in the Cretaceous. However, when they actually did start has been up for a lot of debate. A new genetic study was able to help show that they probably did actually get their start back in the Jurassic, millions of years before at least fossils of them show up regularly in the fossil record. But it also suggests that many of the clades that we now recognize didn't diverge until the Cretaceous which would be part of the reason that we haven't been able to nail down their origin points very well. The late divergence of certain groups would help suggest that that's closer to the origin of these plants. And once that's corrected for in this paper, it does help to show again that the plants probably got started in the Jurassic. So they were around for millions of years longer than we actually know from just the fossil record. And while they did start spreading during the Cretaceous, it was really after the Cretaceous when they started to really take over large parts of environments. And as for other genetic studies, we have one on the dire wolves, which it turns out actually aren't wolves at all. They've generally been placed very closely, because of their morphology, to modern gray wolves. And they were around near the same time, and so it's been thought they were very closely related because they had very similar structures, just with the dire wolf being slightly larger. This study, though, using genetic markers, was able to show that it's really not closely related to wolves at all. Instead, it's much more closely related to certain types of jackal. This paper also found that those two types of jackal aren't actually that closely related to the other canids as well, and places them in their own genus, which has been called Lupulela. The dire wolves, though, diverge even earlier than these jackals did, meaning that they probably diverged while still in North America, and even earlier than any of the other dog lineages diverged. What this suggests, then, is that morphology isn't necessarily always going to be the best bet for examining fossils and trying to understand relationships. Although, for a lot of fossils, it's the only tool we have because we can't get genetic data from them. Staying with the mammals, though, mammals have three bones, two of which came from the jaw, that have become parts of the ear. And this is something that has been newly found to have happened 
multiple, multiple times, or at least confirmed to have happened multiple times. A new fossil from the Middle Jurassic of China was CAT scanned, and from this, researchers were able to see these internal bones inside the skull where the ears would have been. What they found is that it actually has a lot of similarities to the monotremes, animals like the modern day platypus and echidna, which still lay eggs despite being mammals. However, this group that it comes from isn't thought to be related at all, or at least not very closely, to the monotremes. This means that this independent ear structure of having these three bones in this particular arrangement, which is similar but still slightly different from other mammals, evolved more than once. This means we probably won't find a common ancestor to all mammals, or the first mammal, as having all three of these bones set up in the ear. Instead, it means that they were probably starting to evolve that way, but only evolved into the structures that we see in modern day mammals separately and convergently later down the line. And it also means then that mammals probably started earlier than we previously thought, potentially as far back as the late or middle Triassic, although we will need more fossils for that. With those ear bones in mind, they came from the jaw, and we can also look at some of the jaw evolution based on CAT scans, but this time of a very early fish that was thought to be very closely related to the placoderms, which had large bony plates across most of their skulls. Brenda Belaspis was thought to be closer related to this other group, the placoderms, which are now extinct. However, the CAT scan of its skull shows a lot of morphologies within the endocast of the skull for where the brain would have sat and it suggests that it was actually potentially closer related to animals like sharks and rays because of very particular features within that brain. What this suggests is that there's actually a lot of new things we can try and learn and understand about how jaws might have actually first evolved. And that's because this fossil doesn't line up with what we previously knew and other fossils may not either. We may need to go back and CAT scan thousands or at least hundreds of different fossils that are already stored in collections that just haven't been examined this closely. So hopefully there will be something better for us to understand in the future how jaws evolved, rather than what we have now, because this fossil does kind of throw a wrench into what we thought we knew. And on the subject of jaws, we can actually move into the pterosaurs, so back into vertebrates on land again. And that's because there have been a lot of studies that have looked at bite forces in dinosaurs, but this is now just the first paper looking at bite forces in the pterosaurs. And it actually helps to suggest what a lot of them may or may not have been eating. This kind of study essentially looks at the holes that are present in the skull and what the sizes of the muscles would have been and then puts out an estimate for what the bite forces were probably like. And then these authors actually were able to take that bite force and put it over an estimated body mass size of the animal to try and see which of these pterosaurs had stronger bites based on their body size rather than just the strongest bite as a whole. What it suggests is that there's animals like Slinoripterus, which had a very strong bite force and probably fed on a lot of very hard shelled animals such as shellfish. And this has actually been suggested before that this is what one of its main food sources was. It also suggests that the pterosaur tapejara probably fed on hard plant material rather than softer material or hard shelled animal. In addition, there's another pterosaur, Tupuxara, which was probably much more of a generalist and would have fed on a lot of different types of prey. There's also suggestions that animals like Catolorhynchus probably fed on relatively soft prey, which has been suggested based on some of their other adaptations such as very long teeth for trying to catch fish and squid. Overall, this paper really supports a lot of the ideas that we already had about a lot of these pterosaurs. But since it is just the first one of these studies, there is more work to be done with pterosaurs for trying to understand how exactly they would have been living their lives. And in the oceans at the same time as the pterosaurs, you would have had the mosasaurs. And one of these also had very strange jaws, and this was discovered last month. Xenodens kalmanchari has been shown to have a very shark-like jaw, and that's because it had very, very serrated teeth that were very, very close to one another, rather than being more spaced out as it is in other mosasaurs. This kind of slicing pattern suggests it was probably taking large bites out of much larger prey. However, this is also has something that needs to be more tested by finding more fossils of it, because this one fossil is very small and could be representative of a juvenile. Regardless, it may have actually just swam the oceans, much like the modern day oceanic white tip shark does which essentially is a very opportunistic feeder, which does often feed at other animals' carcasses that have died. So it may just be a case of another animal filling that niche when there wasn't another animal to fill it. Unfortunately for Xenodens though, it and the other Mosasaurus went extinct at the very end of the Cretaceous period. And Xenodens lived very close to that time, helping to show just how diverse the oceans were at this time and that they probably would have kept going strong if it wasn't for a giant rock from outer space hitting the planet. And on the subject of shark-like teeth, we're going to move into shark teeth, and specifically the largest shark tooth there is, 
from Otodus megalodon, the largest shark there ever was. Otodus megalodon fed on whales, and generally all we find are teeth. However, sometimes we can also find vertebra, and some of these vertebra are still preserved. We can see growth rings inside of the preserved cartilage. What this new study on some of these vertebra found is that Otodus megalodon was probably born fairly large, about two meters long, and probably exhibited a behavior a lot like that of some modern sharks, such as the sand tiger shark where the eggs actually hatch internally, and essentially the young feed on one another until one of them is left. But at that point, it is large enough to be more likely to be successful, rather than having a bunch of small young. So this is a very unique kind of behavior that we can try and tell from these bones. Additionally, it helps to show that these animals probably grew fairly slowly. This animal died at around 46 years old, and it wasn't fully grown yet. In fact, at only 10 meters in length, it probably could have grown an additional 5 meters, at which point the animal probably would have been pushing close to 88 or even 100 years old, somewhere within that range is what the authors estimated. So, Megalodon would have also been able to live to an extremely, extremely old age, something that's very rare to find in the fossil record is just how old an animal is. So hopefully we can do more studies like this with other animals in the future as well. And another animal that's famous for its teeth that lived around the same time as Megalodon is Smilodon. And that's because Smilodon is better known as a saber-toothed tiger, although it should be called a saber-toothed cat. Two fossils from Ecuador show the same kind of morphology, and this is again, two separate animals. They have an extra socket for a different tooth that comes in the back of the jaw, and this is only found in about 5% of all Smilodon fossils that we know of. These two fossils coming from the same site in Ecuador being about the same size, and based on this morphology being closely related, helps us suggest things about how Smilodon would have also lived its life. Smilodon probably grew in a way that was somewhat intermediary between lions and tigers. In tigers, the young grow very quickly, but then are left on their own. Whereas in lions, there's a longer growth period in which the young are dependent on the mother. What it suggests is that Smilodon still grew relatively quickly. The histology shows that these two animals were both probably about two years old. However, it also suggests that they hung around their parents for longer and relied on the pack, or at least the mother, for a longer time period than modern day tigers do, and probably exhibited some behaviors closer to modern day lions. And then we have a study on a fossilized dinosaur butt, and if that sounds familiar, it's because this same fossil was discussed in another study last year. However, this study goes into greater detail and is by the authors who originally described the fossil in the first place, which was in 2016. So there may or may not be some kind of controversy with some of the authors of that earlier paper stealing data. That's not for me to discuss right now, because that's all for those researchers within their own circles to discuss. Instead, I'm going to talk about the fossil, which shows a lot of different morphology which suggests very unique traits. This paper, like the other one, found that this cloaca, a one-stop hole for reptiles and birds, was very much built like that of the crocodilians in the animal Cetacosaurus. However, the greater detail it goes into is that there were essentially two lobes on each side of it, as well as different tuberosities nearby. What this suggests is that it was probably used as a signaling feature, kind of like a mandrel uses its own rump as a signaling feature today. Now, it may not have been as brightly colored. In fact, we have melanosomes preserved that show that it probably wasn't. However, it does suggest that there was some very bird-like behavior, as some birds do use the same kind of cloacal signaling when they're trying to mate. Additionally, based on the fact that it's more crocodilian-like, there are certain things we can tell about reproduction. Specifically, in a lot of male birds, they don't actually have a penis. The two cloaca essentially just touch up against each other, and the genetic exchange happens. Because this is built much more like a crocodilian's, dinosaurs probably did have a penis, which, you know, it's an interesting thing that we can tell, even though it's not preserved, that this is probably the case of what was going on with the dinosaurs. And so while it may seem very strange to just point out that this dinosaur's derriere was distinctly distended away from the body, it does help us understand better how they were living. And, you know, they may have honestly been kind of like Sir Mix a lot, because they may have liked big butts and could not lie about it. And as for other animals with very good soft tissue preservation, we have the very first fossil of soft tissue preservation of an ammonite. The ammonites famously had very hard shells, which can be found in thousands of places across the world. But this is the first time we've had very good evidence of soft tissue preservation. And there's a couple of different ways it could have happened. One possibility is that the shell essentially dissolved away once the animal died, and so the soft tissue was left there and buried and preserved in the fossil record. The other idea was that it could have actually been a failed predation attempt. Well, failed in the sense that the animal didn't get to eat the ammonite, 
but successful in the fact that it got it out of its shell. And it's been suggested that another cephalopod, something like a squid, may have actually bitten through the shell and pulled the ammonite out of it and then dropped it to the bottom of the ocean where it was preserved. Regardless of how it got there, it does help to show that the ammonites probably had an organ set up that was very similar to that of modern day cephalopods, including the nautilus, which does look very similar, although is different. In fact, the organ setup is so similar that the authors believe they identified male gonads inside of this fossil, which is actually very small. It's also believed to be of the genus Subplanites, which has essentially two distinct size morphs. This fossil being so small suggests that the males, in general, were the smaller of the two sexes in ammonites. And this is something that's been suggested in other fossils as well. However, this is the first time we have at least more concrete evidence of this behavior occurring in the ammonites. And now for the end of the video, we have the very first paper from this year, which suggests one of the animals from the Ediacaran period, even before the Cambrian, can actually be confidently placed within a specific clade that does exist in the modern day. And that's the Lophotrochozoans, which include animals like brachiopods, bryozoans, and the mollusks, like the cephalopods I mentioned, but also animals like mussels and clams. What helped to suggest this was, again, soft tissue preservation, and specifically soft tissue that had been piratized, it had been replaced by fool's gold, iron pyrite. What this means is we can see very distinct structures on the fossils, including very small pores that resemble that in some modern species. Unfortunately, the preservation isn't of fine enough quality to narrow it down even more than just a lophotrochozoan, but having something that is identifiably belonging to a specific clade and phylum that still exists today is a first for the Ediacaran period. And I think as we continue to find more fossils from the Ediacaran period, there's going to be a lot of debate as to what exactly is the Ediacaran and what exactly is the Cambrian, but that's for people who are more focused in that time period to discuss. But if something does change, I will let you know. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I would like to thank the patrons for helping to support the channel. They also get to vote on the what the hell is this, which voting is currently ongoing, so you can check the Patreon down below, and you can check that out and have a vote if you uh, join. So the channel kind of blew up after that Spinosaurus video, so I'm probably gonna end up doing more of those when there are major papers that come out. That'll also help keep these shorter. You know, these might be a little more niche, but you know, someone needs to stay out there doing more niche fossil work or fossil communication. Like I always say, be safe, take care, wear a mask, and don't go extinct.